Uh, tonight we'll finish, well, tonight we'll continue our conversation of chapter 11 vignettes, long form doc, um, documentation. Ryan has graciously um, taken on the speaking responsibilities for this. Uh, initially, my plan was to move on into testing, um, which uh, I'm, not unfortunately, it's a good thing. Uh, there was an update to the testing chapter. So um, in, in my first initial thoughts when John said that, I was like, oh, that's okay. Maybe they just changed a couple paragraphs, added maybe a couple new sections. And then I opened up the chapter and it's a lot more extensive than the first edition. And so um, some of it's the same, some of it's not, but there's quite a few additions to it. And so I just felt that it's probably best that we just table this conversation until next week. Um, but we can kind of talk about at the end of what my plans are for that because it is a long chapter. I think we'll have to split it up, but we can kind of talk about that towards the end of the hour. But so our main focus tonight will be finishing up chapter 11. And so with that, I'm going to uh, transition over to you, Ryan, and let you take over the call. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we are going to do chapter 11 vignettes. So I'm going to share screen. And we're going to go desktop two, hit share. I'm going to move the moderator bar over to this other screen. Um, so team, one of the things I want to uh, clarify going into this chapter 11, I am a tech writer uh, in my own respects uh, for the business that I work with. And so in that regard, I do a lot of documentation, HTML, PDF, markdown, uh, vignettes, I guess, not really because we don't use R very heavily in our business, but um, the topic fascinates me. And so if you were reading this chapter and you you noticed in the first half of this section, a lot of it was de dedicated to just our markdown as a semantic, as a, as a, as a service. Now, you'll often, often get me caught uh, on side conversations about being anti-Microsoft. It's not that I'm anti-anything. It's more towards, I know that Microsoft and the, and the Office suite of tools, Word, PowerPoint, Excel, et cetera, et cetera, they all have a purpose in the business um, uh, world. Um, I don't try to, I don't know, disregard anybody that opts for those tools. I just say, I will not willingly do that because I already know what I need to do is not going to work in those tools. So I feel more familiar in this uh, conversation of Markdown and, and uh, the development of, of using the uh, uh, Bookdown or Knit R or any of the other tools here, Pandoc as a, as a service. So Colin, uh, I'm going to pick up the, uh, we only had a few minutes uh, last week uh, to, to start this chapter off. But one of the things that I, I, I did find ironic, and I do want to repeat if, if it's okay, um, the definition of vignette from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary states that it is a shorthand descriptive literary sketch. <laughs> now, I found uh, irony here is because in the title of the chapter, uh, chapter 11, vignettes, long form documentation, but yet the the definition of vignette is actually short term. So I just found that a little bit uh, uh, awesome to to reflect on anyway as we go through this. Vignettes are known as long-term documentation. There are means in which you can convey um, more about your package and how to apply your package versus just the help menu that are help options that uh, Colin went through the week prior. Okay. Vignettes are not required by CRAN. In, tech, in all technical, uh, CRAN doesn't even compile uh, vignettes. Um, you have to do it as a, as a developer. What they do check though, and this we'll find this out at the end of the chapter, CRAN does validate the code snippets that you do have in your vignette. So just keep that in mind. Um, you do need to make sure that those do render properly uh, prior to submittal uh, for CRAN's uh, linter or, or acceptance. You can use the browse vignettes option in R. Uh, what this does is it opens up a web browser. Uh, it's a local hosted web browser, but it, it, it allows you to access both HTML, PDF, and the uh, I think it's our docs or they call it source, um, but it's, it's three forms. Vignettes come in three different forms. Uh, it's the R code, I guess, HTML page, PDF, and R code. Again, not all packages that you install have vignettes and not all packages require that you have all three forms of the compiled output. So again, this topic of vignettes is more of a uh, author to user uh, exchange kind of how you use your package, how you uh, apply your, your particular code. Um, each vignette provides three things, but not always. Uh, prior to R3.0, uh, 
if you are still running that version of R, I would recommend that you upgrade. Not saying you have to, just it's a recommendation to stay more current. The only way to create vignettes was using the, the uh, service called Sweeve. Sweeve was heavily uh, reliant on LaTeX and, and the author that would develop these vignettes would have to require third, fourth, fifth languages. Uh, these other forms to author in. When NITR came out, or when NITR, the vignette engine of NITR, uh, what it does is allows the author to uh, create our markdown documents, and then they compile into their LaTeX slash PDF using Pandoc and other services. Okay, uh, I put on the side here that this was an opinion. Uh, markdown is limited compared to LaTeX. Um, I don't know. I, I, I would, I would debate that statement. Um, it can be inter, uh, intermingled text, code, and results, both textual and visual. Um, I state this, that that is a fact. Um, both Markdown and uh, LaTeX allow you to achieve that. And your life is further simplified by Markdown packages, which uh, coordinate Markdown and NITR by using prop Pandoc to convert Markdown to HTML. Um, again, this is both opinion and fact. A lot of the times when you're reading these chapters and the author or any of the staff would make a comment towards, um, this is what I think you should do. Uh, I am automatically put that as an opinionated comment and, and kind of uh, always try to test out those theories before I, I make a judgment and say, yeah, uh, hook, line, and sinker, let's buy into it and move forward. Uh, the author recommends the use of our studio, the IDE, if you choose not to. That's up to your prerogative. There's nothing that says you can't or that, that you don't have to use uh, or you have to use our, uh, our studio IDE. Um, it just implies that your life would be simpler if you do choose to use the ARC, our uh, terminal uh, command, our command. Um, you just need to make sure that you install some additional packages, in this case, R Markdown, and that you would ensure that uh, Pandoc was also installed and that it was available on your path directory when you call on it. So just a note there. Uh, I'm not implying everyone should rush uh, to view the Pandoc documentation. Um, Colin, if you don't mind uh, exercising our last week's conversation at the very end of the topic, uh, I, uh, Colin opened up the Pandoc web page and was showing the uh, sheer volume of translation languages that Pandoc supports. So I like to think of this as a Swiss army knife, right? You can write it in nearly any form. You can, you can pass it to Pandoc and then export it into another form. That's the beauty of why Pandoc is so special. Okay. It is uh, highly recommended that you do at least check out that page. Um, you don't have to, but trust me, um, my comments are more towards this senior tech writer comment that I was making uh, at the beginning of our presentation. Okay, moving to the next topic here. So the vignette workflow. To create your first vignette, you're going to use uh, the, the use this package or use this argument, and you're going to say use vignettes and then name it something. Name it something unique. Now, one of the topics I had here, and this was uh, brought up by um, uh, Rex and Colin both, um, this topic of names, namespace. So when you pass an argument like my vignette, it will create your vignette directory. It will create a R markdown document called my vignette. My curiosity is as you add details to it, it is going to be reflective of the namespace directory architecture of your package itself. Um, if you go and hard code this and say, oh, I screwed up, I don't want my vignette, I want it to be something else. Um, I don't know if that's a good plan. And I, 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 I have reason to believe that it would probably be advisable not to just go hard coding things, especially in package development, because there is such an underlying uh, checks and balances that occur. If you run certain commands, it's going to put things in areas that are intended to be there. Um, if you go and modify them um, ad hoc, you're going to break things. You're going to break your package. Okay. So just remember, choose a name that is something uh, widely acceptable. Uh, and if you do have to change it, I would recommend copying everything, deleting it, and then maybe creating a new one. Okay. I haven't tested that theory. It's just something I have in the back of my mind with some of these uh, uh, tools and utilities that we have for package development. Um, this will create a, a vignettes directory. It'll also uh, add all the necessary uh, dependencies to the description file. And again, that's why I'm talking about this namespace association between these two. It's all automated. Um, so it's not a requirement that you have to do it yourself uh, or remember to do it. Um, the system or the package development will take care of it for you. The use this function will take care of that for you. 
Um, it also generates the vignette draft engine um, and then creates a my uh, vignette.rmd file, our markdown file. Once you have this file, the workflow is straightforward. You modify the vignette just like you normally would any other file, uh, and then you can build it, you can compile it. Uh, you can do this by either the control or command plus shift and K. Um, this is your knit icon. And in the textbook, if you're reading this chapter, they inserted the knit icon. Um, I wasn't going to mess with trying to do that. Um, or you can just go to your top point of your R markdown, uh, the tools bar, and just select the knit, and it will compile everything for you. Okay, This allows you to preview the output. There are three important components of the R markdown vignette. The first one is the initial meta block. Now, we are uh, earlier, uh, Colin, if I'm not mistaken, when we were talking about our uh, oxygen or oxygen, and then the other topic of YAML, uh, yet another mark. Uh, what's YAML stand for? I always say yet another markdown language. That's not true. It's uh, yet, uh, yet another something. Um, YAML format is usually this um, uh, field colon and then some text uh, values that you populate in those fields. That particular meta block at the very beginning of this file, um, it's expected, it's implied that you're going to put some details in here and we're going to get to that on the next slide here. The R markdown is, uh, markdown is for a formatting of text and knit, uh, knit R is for interpreting or, or intermingling the text and code results together. So let's talk about what markdown looks like. Uh, I guess it starts with this metadata, metadata block. So the format that we have within these three dashes and the uh, percent sign uh, forward slash backslash, however term you use, vignette index entry, vignette engine, and then vignette encoding. Uh, don't change the encoding, or it's not recommended that you change the encoding. Leave it as default UTF-8, uh, uni, uh, unicode, unitext, uniformat. UTF is an acronym, I'm sorry, it's 8-bit. Um, and then the engine, uh, if you do choose to use a different form of compiling uh, engine, um, if you don't wanna use, excuse me, if you don't wanna use NITR, there are other options. Uh, by default, NITR and then R markdown is the, is the format that gets populated. It does have the title of your file, so my vignette. Um, there are details here that they recommend that you do modify should you choose. Uh, the title being the first one, um, possibly the uh, output uh, format. If you don't want it to be in HTML, you can uh, replace that with PDF instead. Um, it just is going to compile into a different file structure. Okay. The metadata is written in YAML. There we go. Uh, YAML ain't another markup language. That's, that's the uh, acronym YAML. Um, I do recommend if anybody does, does want to learn more about YAML as a, as a format of text, uh, format of authorship, um, in essence, if you're getting into Docker and Kubernetes and all the other uh, future containerized workspace concepts, uh, it would be almost an uh, essential that you comprehend what YAML implies. Uh, again, it's it's the idea that you have a field, a, a, a title of, of, of a uh, placeholder, uh, colon, space, and then whatever uh, 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 value you want to enter for that field. So each line consists of a field name, uh, you use the colon as a separator and then the value of that field. So again, if we scroll up to the top here, we can see that title is our, our uh, field, uh, output is our field, and then vignette. Um, the values that we're populating here may or may not require uh, colons in that or quotation marks uh, surrounding those strings. All right. Uh, in the above example, the greater than symbol or uh, I guess right facing uh, bracket uh, character means run the following lines as text or as plain text. And if you're familiar with LaTeX, uh, this is kind of a LaTeX ish form of calling on a, uh, a field name. The three elements of vanilla vignette are included as the title, the author, and the date. Uh, in our example above, we did not have author or date listed. Um, I believe you should be able to just, uh, when you create that my vignette, you might be able to populate these arguments uh, with those field names uh, already in the creation and then have the engine uh, populate the, that YAML file for you. The reason I say that is because the author and the date were not listed in our above example or in the textbook. Uh, the output defines your output type, whether it be HTML, PDF, or slideshow. 
Um, again, this is going to be the rendering engine Pandoc as it goes through its various steps of com uh, compilation until it gets to its final output. Uh, in the example above, we had it listed as an HTML output. Uh, vignette, uh, this is going to be your LaTeX-esque legacy codes. Um, the only one that you should change is the index entry, and that's the name of the file, my vignette. Uh, note, maybe it is just me, but uh, wouldn't, I'm sorry, wouldn't do this for, for the, maybe it's just me, but wouldn't do this from the start. Or rather, if you change the index title, wouldn't you want to change the file name too? Open for discussion. A moment ago when I was explaining the workflow between this automated system of package development, creating this vignette, and you run this, you know, use this, create my vignette. Uh, if you go in and start modifying things uh, ad hoc without the automated system, uh, I believe you're probably going to start breaking things if you go that route. Um, Rex, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot, or if there's anybody else that has done package development, Brendan, you had mentioned you were in the midst of a, a package development as well. I don't know if documentation is at the forefront of your thoughts at the moment. Does anybody have any thoughts there? I think I'd probably, like, if I wanted to change the name, okay. I'd probably just make a whole new vignette and then just copy paste on it. <laughs> right, right, it. right. I just, because when you do the use this, it just does it all for you. So I just mm -hmm. don't want to mess with that. Well, and I, I, I'm referencing some other book clubs, uh, the engineering production grade shiny apps. Uh, Colin Fay had made a comment about the Golem package. And when you, when you generate Golem, there are so many different files and, and points that Golem creates. And I know the package development does use this and all the, uh, the dev tools, et cetera, do a similar essence. If you go modify those files, you are going to break something. And, and, and my, my reference to this or my experience in this mindset is more of the Linux world and some of the utilities when um, you'll open a text file to, to review it, you know, uh, like cat a file or something. And it will explicitly state at the very beginning, do not modify this file from inside this entry. Um, you know, use this command instead and it'll auto populate instead. There's functions, there's, there's, there's workflows built within this uh, tool chain or workflow and yeah, by, by going in and modifying it on your own, um, you're, you're playing with fire. That's only my recommendation. I'm not saying it will. I have not tested it or have experience with package development yet uh, to confirm that comment. I'm only leaning towards caution. All right. So let's talk about Markdown. This is my, my favorite, favorite topic. Um, I've been pushing a lot of our staff, a lot of our teams uh, that uh, are currently author uh, software engineering uh, to use Markdown instead, primarily because it's just simpler. You don't have to try and mess with styles and Word and all the other uh, uh, container, uh, sorry, linear documentation workflows. In Word, you start at the top, uh, beginning and then you continually write infinitely until you finish whatever it is you're trying to say. There is a issue though, that if your Word file gets too large or you put too many images in it, um, it will literally corrupt itself. So you don't have that same tendency if you use these more eloquent or more uh, formal tech writing services. Markdown just happens to be simple. It's easy. Um, and it will compile into almost nearly anything okay, using Pandoc. Uh, I made a reference to John Gruber. Uh, John Gruber was the initial person that uh, authored Markdown initially. Um, you can check out his uh, website, Daring Fireball. Um, it is a very satiric, comical read. Um, as you as you uh, uh, comment on on just markdown syntax in general, but uh, I'm excluding a very extremely long quote uh, from Mr. Gruber. But the shortened version is that markdown is intended to be easy to read and easy to write as feasible. There's literally nothing to it. Uh, it's it's maybe five characters, six characters total um, that will allow you to do some really awesome things with markdown. Okay. Uh, there is a reference to a question mark in the above menu. I've checked multiple places and can't find it. Alternately, options to view Markdown quick references are, you can go to help and then Markdown quick reference. What I was referencing, if the team can give me a moment, I'm going to open this real quick. I'll show you what I was referring to. Um, the image in the textbook or the reference in the textbook was indicating that there was a question mark across the top of our toolbar. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's the R version that I'm running right now, or R Studio version I'm running right now. I didn't find that question mark, and I couldn't make, I couldn't uh, determine the reference of maybe where it, it was uh, uh, removed. 
But if you do go to the help menu, what we're referring to is this markdown quick reference. And this file specifically will give you all examples of all the various uh, markdown formatted uh, details. Let me zoom into that. So let's see what I'm talking about here. All right. And these are the same examples that I'm, I'm going to show you in the text or in the uh, slide deck as well. Go back to our presentation. Nope, not that one. Sorry, guys. There we go. Um, so let's let's think of it this way. If you want a heading level, a heading level is a pound sign or a hashtag, whatever term you want to use it. Um, this particular hashed symbol, uh, one entry space, whatever text you're going to put is going to be a heading level one. If you put two symbols, it's going to be a heading level two, three symbols is a heading level three. Now, this doesn't go infinitely. I think it goes to maybe heading level seven. But it, I would even recommend if you were at that degree of uh, discombobulation, if you were getting down to a heading levels five and six, um, I would even pause and say, you might want to rewrite your text because if you're that nested into topics, you're way off into the weeds of whatever it is that you're trying to convey. Um, my limitation or my recommendation to most authors is heading levels three to, to four and then cut it off there. If you need to go further than that, you might want to reorchestrate the topic in which you're trying to convey. Note, since our uh, book club uh, notes are in Markdown, uh, I didn't want to conflict with the future compiling of this. So some of the code snippets I have here aren't going to run, or they're going to be a little bit weird uh, when, I, when I write them out. Okay. Now, lists. This one is, is more of an argument for anybody that would like to debate. Um, I'm more than willing to uh, entertain this topic. Um, the recommendation that we had, or the two examples that we have in our textbook, uh, lists both a hyphen and an asterisk as being uh, entries for bullets. And it's true. Markdown will recognize that. The point being is that the asterisk is actually used in the syntax for emphasis or italics. Um, so I try to avoid using asterisks heavily. Um, what I do is often just use hyphens instead, and that will render as a, as a uh, bulleted statement instead. The other thing that I want to also uh, preface here is when you compile or when you render your markdown into a markup language, HTML, PDF, or any other form, keep note that you need a space between a paragraph and the bulleted list. If you don't have that space and you render, it's just going to mash everything together. Um, the reason for this is because HTML or, or just text editing period doesn't recognize white space, uh, or or it 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 doesn't uh, it doesn't implicitly know what to do with white space. So it just mashes everything together as one block. You need to create that additional paragraph break in between whatever text you had prior and then whatever uh, entry you have for special characters, this bullet bulleted list, make sure that you have that extra space in there. And I would say the same as with tables, the same as with quotes, the same as with hyperlinks, just make sure that you have that, that break in between. Um, if you try to keep everything as a, as a linear line of entry, um, you'll have some weird things happening. I don't know if anybody else has experienced that in authoring before. Um, it's an easy repair, and you won't notice it until after it compiles. Uh, things just look odd, so you want to go back and, and uh, correct that, add that white space in there. Uh, but what I'm doing here, and this is a, a code block, uh, if you would want to view the uh, text that I had uh, to compile this, this was in a, a, a quoted block uh, or a, a coded block, um, and then this is the actual rendered output of what that sub-element looks like. So the difference what you're seeing here uh, and they make a reference to four spaces. So I'm not one that's going to hit my space bar four times. Um, I'm probably a little too lazy and just hit the tab. Uh, and most, most text editors, formal text editors, uh, a tab is going to enter that four character entry. There's rare cases where a tab is actually rendered differently or, or interpreted differently than four spaces. Uh, Python is one thing that comes to mind. Um, I've also ran into this error in terminal editors. Uh, so if you were to use Nano, uh, uh, Vi, Vim, uh, Emacs, or any of the other text editors in that regard, uh, you would want to have an explicit for space entry to create that uh, sub bullet. Um, otherwise, it may not render properly. And that's my big blob of note down here at the bottom. I kind of go off the deep end talking about that. Um, 
the interpretation of your encoding, uh, the um, ASCII characters from your keyboard on entry of the file. And then as Pandoc or, or any rendering engine uh, compiles that, it may interpret it odd. Um, if you really, 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 really want to go down this rabbit hole real quick, um, there is an option to ingest HTML, raw HTML tags into your markdown. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, the one statement I'll make is that if you do interpret it that way, um, special characters in HTML are treated differently. Um, anybody that's probably entered a URL and noticed that it's a percent %20 uh, in between different words, um, percent %20 is actually a space. Um, another one is the ampersand, uh, the, the uh, and symbol, if you want to call it that. The, um, uh, that is, uh, I think it's ampersand a and D semicolon, I think is the HTML for it. Sorry, I just want to uh, HTML coding for this symbol. There you go. Uh, so there are times where you need to uh, ensure that you're writing your code in HTML, raw HTML. Um, again, this is your compiler that's doing this, your document object model. Um, and it's a rarity that you'll run into this problem, but I'm just forewarning you now that if your, your uh, uh, authorship starts to look gibberish, it's not you. It's probably the way the interpreter is, is uh, reading your language, okay. especially with LaTeX and some of the other um, features that we can introduce into our authorship. Okay. All right. Uh, ordered lists um, can start with the number one. Um, we don't recognize alpha characters in Markdown. And this is something that I, I don't want to argue it. It's, it, it is what it is. Um, the thought process of an ordered list, the one, two, three, four, A, B, C, D uh, concepts, alpha characters are not recognized as an ordered list in Markdown. They are if you generate HTML forms. Um, the other comment and I'm telling you, if, if you and I were on the same team authoring something and I, I, I find that you're doing this, I will, I will negatively critique you uh, to no end. Uh, Markdown is lazy. Um, you can just put number one, number one, number one, and number one. And the system on compiling will recognize that as an ordered list and it will increment the numbers. Um, in code review, if you do follow this format though, it does look really weird to, to uh, review it. So uh, does anybody follow this topic at all when they're writing? I, I, I'm trying to be um, somewhat comical, not satire, but also uh, just don't make me crazy as well. Uh, this is not something I would recommend doing at all. Um, I would probably author mine to look like this instead. If you do choose to use alpha characters, you can do that. Um, unfortunately, it has to be written from the file itself, or I will be more than willing to show you how to generate a HTML order list with alpha characters if you're so willing and want to learn that. All right. Um, continuing on, I've never used or had to, uh, or had need to use the definitions list. I thought this was kind of neat. Um, in all of my Markdown experience, I've never used definitions before. But when I rendered it, I thought, huh, I, I could probably use this. This is kind of cool. By calling out the definition tag and then prefacing it with a colon and then whatever statement you want as your definition, you can also include this as a list. So that's just separating the lines of text with another entry of colon. Um, what ends up rendering is this definition, kind of a to-do tag or, or bold italics, uh, and then whatever entries you have underneath it. This is not the same as a quote. Um, you'll see that a quote is um, kind of a shadowed bar on the left-hand side of your markdown. Um, definitions are a little bit different. Maybe if you have um, terms, definitions that you want to convey as you're, as you're writing your vignette. All right. Uh, inline formatting. So we've all used bold, italics, and underline. Those are three common features. Um, underline is not technically supported in markdown format, uh, but it is if you do use a, uh, it's not emphasis tag, what is the under, underscore tag, underline tag in HTML, it would render it as well. Uh, technically only italic and bold are recognized. And the format that they want you to reference is either a single underscore or a double underscore. Again, this is my own opinion. So 
I'm more than happy and willing to receive critique, both negative and positive from team members. Um, I don't recommend using underscores. Um, two purposes, one, they kind of look like file names. That's my first thought. And then the second is in most of our scripting languages, if it's not R, it's Python or some other C++ Java type language, the double underscore is uh, a valid naming convention. And it's not recommended that you try to interface with that with Markdown. Um, so what I would recommend instead is the asterisks. And I made that comment earlier about the bulleted statements. So you want to encapsulate or wrap around your term that you are putting in italics. Uh, or if you do a double um, asterisk, it would be a bold statement instead. Okay. One more element to this. If you do a three asterisk entry and then closing uh, entry, that would be a bold italics. So similar to this definition kind of look up here. That would be a three asterisk entry. Uh, links. Uh, if you want to talk about anchor tags, H references, um, any form of, of rendered pointer at some other memory location or some other object in your file structure uh, or some ephemeral URL out in the web. The way this works is in HTML, it's an href tag, and then you would provide the entry of, of pointer that you want it to go to. In Markdown, it's just square brackets. So whatever text you want, uh, Colin Berkey and then Colin's uh, blog, right? That would be a particular destination. If you had an image that you wanted to enter, um, images usually put a, a uh, greater than symbol in the front, but um, it's whatever uh, hovering text, what's that called for um, adaptive reading uh, websites that have, when you hover your mouse over an image, it'll give you another rendered text of, of, of what the image is. Um, there's a policy for that in web development, doesn't matter. Um, you don't have to put a link text if you're referencing an image, um, but it would be recommended if you're having a URL. Uh, the last example that they have here, this is more these open and close brackets, uh, or what do you call those, the greater than, less than symbols. Um, that's gonna just generate a raw URL. And it does the same thing, but it's not quite uh, identical. Here, we're providing text with a undertone. If you look uh, at my very bottom left-hand side of my Chrome browser, you'll see that I'm pointing at a particular location. And then if you use this just raw HTML, um, that's just going to point, uh, open up your browser and point you somewhere in the world. Any questions so far? Any details so far? Am I being entertaining enough that at least it's engaging? Um, kind of boring topic, I suppose. All right. I think you were, was it alt text was what you were trying to recall? I think alt text is the word. Yeah. It's, uh, I, 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 the word disability comes to mind, but I know that that's not an approved term. Um, it is uh, the ability of text readers um, being able to um, do different color, color associations, et cetera. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a Linux person uh, attached to Linux for the rest of us. Um, and he does, he works with um, Orca, I think is the name. It's a, it's a whale. It's, it's the killer whale, but um, he is, uh, I don't know if it was by accident or it was genetics, but he's blind. And so um, when he's as a, as a software developer and, and, and something, somebody that supports this um, alt text type uh, entry, there's a, uh, there's a, a huge push within the web development world that um, you're excluding quite a few people if you don't include alt text or, or uh, various rendered manners to, to uh, allow other services to interpret your web page uh, or your code. And I can't remember the term and I'm sounding ignorant. I'm just going to keep moving on. I feel terrible that I don't remember what that is. It's a, it's a, it's a disabilities thing. Um, but, but again, I know that even using that term is, is giving an inflection that's not uh, a negative connotation. It's not negative. Um, it's, you may not have eyesight. You may not have um, the ability of typing on a keyboard. So you may be using your voice to type instead, voice to text. Anyway, I'm going to keep going. Um, tables. Uh, so as of late, I've witnessed many of our book clubs just so happen to be that we're in this topic of 
vectors and data frames and different plotly tables and, and charts, et cetera. Um, in the markdown format, you can render a table very, very quickly. My only, only critique to this format is, oh, it's one line of text. And if it gets buggery, it starts to look weird. There are tools, but I have not found them in R that will align everything for you in your markdown table so that it does look textually presentable um, in authoring. And then when it renders, uh, what you'll end up getting is, is, a, is a very presentable looking table. Um, you'll have your column headers. Um, and that's, again, what you have right, left, def default, and center are just examples. The colon here is what is indicating, do you want it to be right justified, sorry, left justified, centered, um, left justified or, or, uh, or uh, by default. Um, so just different ways that you can manage your text, how you want it to render on the, on the page. Um, I make a long worded reference here that um, in a lot of our tools, a lot of our services, a lot of our manner in which we receive data, the databases, uh, if you're familiar with, with rendering a table in a SQL database um, while in terminal logged in and then, you know, just paint it to the screen concept, you can export that into a textual form and it will look very similar to a markdown table. That was actually where I, I first comprehended the association of what this table rendering format looks. I also want to be very careful that a lot of our staff, teams, individuals that we collaborate with, they will use Excel because that's the only tool that they're familiar with. There's nothing wrong with Excel, technically. Um, Excel is gonna be better than if you were to have a Word document with a nested table in there. That's, even, that's not even a table, that's something weird. But the point being that in Excel, uh, a lot of staff will, will start to merge, uh, merge cells together. Um, I always seem to run into problems uh, working through merged merged cells. Um, the other one is if you do alt uh, alt entries, and so you have uh, multiple lines of text, you know, breaks inside your table cell um, from a table, and then you try to ingest it into Markdown, and it just gets really ugly. There are tools, there are features that allow you to do this. One of which is Cable. Um, I've never used Cable necessarily. Um, I have other utilities that I will generate um, outside of R when I'm in this when the, in this documentation mindset. Um, but going into Google, you can look at, you know, markdown table generator where you can just data dump an Excel file into the in, into the engine and it will render back the plain text sh uh, should you need it. Um, this cable option I have not tried. Uh, there is print R and then pander as another example of uh, alternate references to work with this. Does everyone understand or, or comprehend what I was talking about when I made the reference about alt enter? So you have multiple line breaks inside one cell of an Excel table. Um, when you compile that, it does, it looks really weird. Um, it, usually you have these infinitely large uh, line breaks of, of white space in between the entries. Um, it looks presentable in Excel, but when you try to manage it outside of Excel, it, it turns horrendous. So I often try to tell our staff, don't do that. Please don't use Excel as a documentation tool, um, in my own personal opinion. It gets the job done, but it's not something I want to support for long term. So, all right, continuing on. Um, code blocks. Now, we've always, uh, or we've, we as authors to our book clubs have probably ran into our code block or our, our snippet uh, tool. And what you're using is a back tick. Now, the back tick is the same key that you would use as your tilde. Uh, it's the top left corner of your keyboard just underneath the escape key. Um, the back tick is probably not generated in most operating systems. Um, it is a recognized ASCII character, but it's not used in a lot of our, our programming. In Markdown, that back tick signifies a single code block or an inline code block statement. Okay. Uh, if we were to use it in a grouping of block, that's going to be a three tick mark. And uh, Colin, I think you made a reference to it last week, maybe, or we were talking about the Roxygen. There were some keyboard commands that you were you were discussing with a uh, an entry. 
the uh, backtick at symbol and then whatever code we wanted. I believe it's command option or control option, command option, control option I uh, will create a insertion of a code block in R. Um, I don't know from a Windows perspective what that combination would be. Maybe Windows control I. Um, shift control I for Windows, shift, shift control. command I for Mac. But then there's also the, if you do, like this is for if you're an R, Mar doc, R, an R Markdown document. Mm -hmm. If you also, the other one that I've been trying to get back into my workflow is if you do, and I learned this from John, is if you go, um, so start on a new line. Yeah. Go R, just type the letter R, shift tab. Oh, um, yeah. That's Gives you the labels nicer. and options. Yeah. yeah. I've been trying to get that into my workflow because it just reminds me cool. to label my, my yes. uh, yeah. So thanks, John Harmon, for that little tip. <laughs> um, I'll come back to this in a second. That's going to be uh, uh, towards the closure of this, of this discussion. And if I am starting to run out of time, please let me know. Um, if I'm going along on the on the discussion, you're about the 15 minute mark. So okay, you're good. still doing okay. We we should have plenty of time then. All right. Um, specifically with these uh, multi line code snippet blocks, um, we I discovered that Zoom does not the the Zoom um, uh, what do you call it the chat window it does not recognize Markdown. Um, other tools like uh, Slack does. So if you are to generate or entry uh, into Slack uh, notification, it does recognize Markdown. Uh, one of my favorite tools when I'm trying to orchestrate large brain matter is Trello, uh, this Kanban type system of to-dos and you know ordered list kind of concepts. Uh, I, I saw a similar entry in GitHub. I think it was GitHub projects that allows you to do the same thing. It's kind of like traceability track tracking, you know, where am I at in my workflow concept? Um, both of which would obviously recognize Markdown as well. So these code snippets uh, are important. Um, if anybody is like me, and I think that I'm 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 like the masses, not the exception. Um, I got too many things going on in the brain, so um, I have note blocks everywhere. I put weird snippet things all over the place. I try to keep my own uh, diaries and entries and I argue with myself, et cetera. So um, the code snippets uh, or markdown in general is very helpful to go back and, and kind of scratch your head of what you were thinking, document yourself. Okay. Um, you wanna know uh, something crazy. Uh, if any language highlighted uh, you want to reference Markdown will render it in the Markdown form. What I was going to uh, talk in that regard, going back to R real quick, is here in this code block, we're explicitly calling out the R language as the rendered text or the, the kernel that compiles it. But guess what? We can do Python. That would recognize something. We can do JavaScript. Oops, sorry. Okay. or maybe it's JS, I think it's JS. Um, and then whatever you wanna do with it, you could do Ruby on Rails, you could do uh, Bash. Um, the, the, the point that this is important is that um, A, you have to have that program installed on your computer first for it to recognize. Uh, it doesn't do it automatically. Uh, but when you're talking about uh, syntax highlighting, um, making, making documentation easy to read and interpret at a later point, SQL chunks. Um, if you were to call out the language you want it to be in and then paste in your code, when Markdown renders it, it would populate it in that recognized format of, of text editing or, or code editing, uh, the, the color coding uh, that compiles with it. Uh, I found that to be fascinating if anybody else has used that before. If not, this might be something that would help you in the future. Uh, I'm not listing the full supported languages, just know Pandoc is awesome and it supports nearly anything you want to use. So yeah, Pandoc is an amazing tool. Okay. All right, let's go into workflow. Uh, Knit R is the package that provides the uh, compiling engine, this vignette engine. Um, Knit R allows you to intermingle code results and text together. That's just this format of being able to make bullet statements and ordered lists and code blocks and then have it magically appear in this really awesome rendered format. 
In my experience, I seem to be troubleshooting that are most often um, errors seem to maximize most of its use. Uh, that's me. I'm a person that probably is not writing in R as I probably should be, um, or I'm not utilizing the tool as it's intended. So for me, I'm uh, constantly trying to troubleshoot NIT, uh, any document, <laughs> any time I call NIT, um, weird things happen. That has no relation or has anything to do with the package developer or what NIT does. Um, I'm very much appreciative and happy with Bookdown, R Markdown, and NIT R. Uh, they all come from the same developer. Um, the important element to remember is the curly brackets in the in the knit R object. If you want to render uh, a code block in R, um, you just put curly brackets around it and then anything that goes along with it. What the example we have below uh, says that, uh, this is from the book, but it said, here's a code block in formal syntax then it renders into this code block with the curly brackets, which turns into this code block, which turns into this code block. And I guess I, I, I'm failing to recognize the intent of what this example was conveying to us. I believe the, the reason for it was saying that you can write it this way and using knit uh, or knit R, will compile it to this markdown format that will compile it into this rendered output. Um, if somebody else has a different interpretation, please let me know. Um, I, I felt that this one example in the, in the reading uh, didn't convey exactly what the author was after. Um, so I wanna see if there's another interpretation if anybody else read this section or had a different conclusion than I did. The example was lost on me. I, I that's my point. I did not understand it. Uh, do you want me to show you the example I'm referring to? The section I'm referring to. It's rather lengthy in, in the first entry text. Our packages. Oh, PK. There we go. Where's our book club? There we go. This is chapter eleven, vignettes, and we are under knit R. Uh, it's this block. It says, considering the simple example below, note that the knit R block looks similar to a fenced code block, but instead of using R, we're using these uh, curly brackets R. I, I think it's, so I think what it's trying to get at is that the curly brackets allow you to add additional options within your R markdown document. Okay. Okay. So like if you were just going to use just like the, you know, the, the fence code block, which is the R without the curly brackets, you're just yeah. you're just showing the syntax, you're just highlighting it. However, those curly brackets are useful and someone changed my interpretation of it, but like you can go like, you know, comma, add a label to it. You can do, um, you know, you were talking about your like SQL example. Yes. You can add like the connection object to it. So if you have a physical connection object to your SQL database, you can add that connection object into mm -hmm. that cold block so that the SQL thing can run. So my assumption would be is that NITR, what it does is it uses that curly brackets to say, hey, you're gonna get an R command here, run that R command. Good point, and or follow the instructions within the curly bracket, the options that we're applying to it, our arguments we're applying to it. That would be my guess. And then just the simple R is just like, just do the syntax highlighting. You're not gonna, you're not gonna process any R code, but. Well, when, when I was authoring this right before uh, the presentation, I did go to the, the source, this chapter of GitHub, and I wanted to make sure that I'm not missing something here. So like if there's hidden text that they have, uh, that's right here. Uh, if there was some hidden text that I may be missing. Um, and the only thing that I noticed was just the, code block snippet looks a little bit mm. weird. Um, but that could be because of the authoring platform as well, uh, as you book down and, and create the uh, actual rendered output of this chapter. So that, it, yeah, um, I'm with you, Colin. Um, I may need to saturate on this section of the document a little bit longer. Um, I think there's just some really like, spending some time with the options that are available. I mean, yes. this is outside of package development, but the options right. that are available with the curly brackets, you could do some really 
really cool things mm-hmm. um, with the options in there. So with, which we're getting to. So, yeah, well, I, in, in the options, I, I literally just lifted them from the text and then tried to clean them up a bit. Um, they were a little long worded in, in some of the, the comments, but for example, um, if you're, I just put here uh, within the three code blocks, you can just enter a, a, uh, line of text in the in the curly brackets, or you can explicitly call knit r inside your code block, and then this options code chunk set uh, or ops chunk set. What this does is globally uh, create uh, across anything that you put in that code block. Uh, for example, uh, the warning: there's a bunch of arguments here, but they're very awesome, so we do want to cover them. Uh, evaluate: if you put evaluate true, it will render in your output. Um, no matter who it is that opens it, it will render. Um, if you put it as false, it's just going to uh, pr- uh, prevent the evaluation of the code. You can do an echo false. Uh, this turns off printing. And they did make a, a comment here. Generally, you shouldn't use this in vignettes, um, uh, mainly because there may be some supporting code that is also required inside that code snippet that the person trying to view the vignette in its raw form uh, may not have. And so it'll error out on them. Uh, results, uh, you can put results hide. Uh, so this obviously prevents the output of the equation uh, or, or the code block from uh, exporting standout. Uh, warning false and message false are two ways that you can uh, suppress any of the warnings or the messaging that occurs during code block evaluation. Um, errors as true captures any errors in the block. This can be helpful, especially um, if you are debugging, troubleshooting your, your vignette. Um, anybody has probably ran into this uh, problem when they go to compile and you start getting these weird errors. Well, you can say error equals true, and then, then it'll point exactly what the error is, or maybe give you a little bit more um, specific pointer at where that error occurred. Uh, collapse true and commit. I don't know what that special character is, uh, but collapse true and comment equals this. Uh, is a preferred way for displaying code output. Um, I believe that means it's multi-block or it puts the uh, evaluated output of the equation in the commented form. Um, don't quote me on that. Let me double check. Um, results as is, uh, treats the output of the R code as literal markdown. Um, figure show hold holds the figures until the end of the code block. Uh, and then figure width and figure height, you can actually create a space in your rendered output, both HTML, PDF, and R Markdown. Um, you can create that space of how big or small you want your figure to uh, result to be. Um, they're going to be in inches, by the way. Uh, recommend checking out the help options uh, when you are uh, messing with any of these evaluated forms. There is a really awesome reference and I'm sorry, I did not pull up the hyperlink fast enough for the presentation. I will try to post it in Slack, but um, there's a book uh, in Bookdown and it goes through all of these different various options. It's an amazing uh, piece of work that uh, really supports a lot of this vignette type long form documentation. All right, we're almost done, Colin. A few more uh, seconds here. To run a single code block, just one entry code block in your, in your text, it's gonna be command alt C. Um, if, you re, if you want to rerun the entire document in its entirety in a new R session, you can do either control or command plus shift and K. And what that does is it'll create a new kernel. It'll take the contained code blocks in that markdown and it will render all of them for you. Um, again, this is a little bit more of a, a better way to view everything to see if there's any errors uh, coming out. You can build all your vignettes, uh, vignettes from the console using DevTools build vignettes. Um, this is very rarely, if ever, useful. Um, that's not my comment. That was from the, the textbook. Uh, instead, what you want to do is do a DevTools, DevTools build. And this creates a package bundle with the vignettes included. Okay, We talked about this, I believe, in chapter two or chapter three when we were talking about the, the build, uh, build all, et cetera. Um, our studio's build and reload does not build the vignettes. So when, when you submit uh, your package to CRAN for wide acceptance, um, all CRAN does is validate that the code snippets can run and interpret, but they do not actually contain the vignette itself. So what you want to do is this, this build function, packaging function, um, and then that will also include your HTML and your uh, PDF if, if you choose to compile it in that form. 
You can force building with DevTools install GitHub build vignettes true. Uh, this will also install all suggested packages as well. But again, we're accessing this awesome package of DevTools to achieve that. Last comment, I believe we're almost done. Yeah, two more slides. Um, when writing vignettes, uh, you're teaching someone how to use your package. So the intent or the implication as the author of the package is also trying to show others how to use or apply use case, your arguments and your functions within the package. Um, it is a very mm, narrative form of acceptance or narrative form. You're not trying to sell anybody on anything. You're just trying to provide examples of, hey, you can do it this way. And hey, maybe you can try it this way. And if you're using this package over here, go over here and do it instead. Um, my only critique to this thought process of this narrative form is upon entry into the R world, a new user may find all of this very confusing because ha, there's references all over the place. Uh, and it's, it's hard to guide that person to say, this is really what you need to do to be successful. Okay. Um, the other option would be you're too focused and you're boiling the ocean on that one subject for an entire um, 15 minutes of read. Uh, writing vignettes allows you to rethink the, dif the difficult parts of your package using vignettes as a teaching presentation element can gain feedback from your peers. Uh, additionally, re uh, additional readings include uh, Kathy Sierra's Creating Passionate Users. Um, this link I did access, but I didn't completely read all of it. And then the other one, this is actually a, a, a book, uh, Joseph M. and Williams, Joseph Bisup, Bisup. Uh, I think it was something styles. The link didn't render properly. So let me open this real quick. Uh, this is the Amazon link. Uh, style, Lessons in Clarity and Grace. Um, I have not read this book. Um, this is the first time I'm making reference to it. So um, I need to go check that out and kind of get to see what we're trying to convey here. Um, there's a lot of these ggplot type formatted um, gram of graphics type books that uh, guide you in the best practices of visualization or guide you in the best practices of written text, written form, right? We're not talking about collegiate uh, APA and, and, and all the different styles, et cetera. This is more of like just the spoken language, how to capture your audience and, and convey technical information to them uh, very eloquently and, and, and uh, concise. Um, from an organization standpoint, often one vignette is not or is enough depending on the size and complexity of your package. Um, there's nothing that says you can't have multiple vignettes. Um, if you do rec, dplyr is an example of multiple vignettes. If you do happen to create more, um, it is recommended that you link them together in a concise way or a format that somebody could follow the trail of thought from one vignette to the next, um, allowing this more concise corpus of media that is supporting your particular package. Uh, vignettes should be self-contained while also linking to additional information if available uh, and then or other vignettes as needed. Last topic, last sentence, and our last note, and I'm done. In respect to CRAN, again, CRAN does not compile your notes or your vignettes. They do not have Pandoc. They do not render uh, in package development. You as the author and the package developer have to do that first before submittal. Uh, CRAN does validate your vignette R markdown to ensure that the code snippets contained do um, render properly and do not error out. Um, that's references to your descriptions, et cetera. Uh, common problems. The first one is the vignette builds interactively but fails with missing packages. This is often likely because you did not include those additional packages in your descriptions. The other option would be to put them in the suggests, but I'm trying to rack my brain and Rex, I believe you may have went over this or, or Colin, if you went over this, um, I need to go back and rewatch our past uh, videos if this topic did come up. All right, uh, everything works interactively, but the vignette does not show up after you installed the package. Uh, one of the followings could have occurred um, to make that work. Uh, the person may have to just do dev tools install, and then that's gonna pull all of the packaging. This is your entire, um, uh, uh, shared service on CRAN. If they do that DevTools install, um, it's going to pull everything down and they may be able to build your vignette locally. 
The directory is called vignettes and not vignette. Um, this is probably because you did ad hoc. Um, you named something and, and didn't let the system do it instead. Uh, check that you haven't inadvertently excluded the vignettes from the R uh, build ignore. Um, I'm really big about this one. I'm actually troubleshooting at one of the packages I have for um, a uh, node package manager. I've got a buggy system going on right now. And I know that I put something in the in the get ignore. Um, so that could also be a rendering issue too. Ensure you have the necessary vin uh, vignette metadata. Uh, that's your YAML block at the very top. And then if you see error true, you must also use this Perl false command as well. If your vignette uses large quantities of graphical objects, grobs, the file size may grow too. Technically, there's no size limit, but however, be prepared that you may have to justify why your vignette is so massively graphical heavy uh, and or file size storage space heavy. Um, if you need to go back, you could probably start to take some of those examples out and maybe offset in a different rendering format so your files aren't so massively large in submittal. Um, that's all I have. This last topic was just a couple of links uh, to some other um, comments. One of them is um, if you go to the R Markdown page, uh, R Studio has uh, other options for building in LaTeX and PDF uh, recommendations anyway. And then it says, if you do have a really awesome vignette and you want to showcase your, your amazing authoring abilities, uh, try to or possibly post to the Journal of Statistical Software or the R Journal. Uh, and in both of the instances, you will get peer review uh, and feedback. And then from my own my own opinion, my own words to the to the universe, uh, from one tech writer to the masses, documentation allows you, uh, others to view your world, your specific world, your mind. Um, always try to welcome criticism, both good and bad. Um, everyone is entitled to their opinion, so you, not everybody is, is going to be friendly, uh, and that's okay, except both sides of the fence. This will always make you a better person and a better author in general. So that's all I have. I'm done, Colin. I hope that was uh, not too far over our time. No, that was excellent. That was that was great. I really appreciate um, really appreciate you sharing you the material and taking on the speaking responsibility, and then also kind of um, peppering in some of your experience too as well, because yeah. that always definitely adds to the conversation. So, yeah. um, before I kind of open it up to any questions or additional comments, I want to kind of make a make some announcements for next week, just in case anybody has to jump off here. Again, if you have to jump off because we're already past our nine o'clock, go ahead. Um, but just a heads up, uh, the, the testing chapter has changed recently. So, um, you know, if you've already read the older version, hey, you get some more material now, read the newer version. Um, so uh, I've done some schedule shifting around to accommodate this change. Looking at the testing chapter, I just, I don't think we can get all of it in one session, to be frank. So I think what we what we can reasonably get to would probably be up to about section 12.8 or 12.9. Uh, 12.8 being like files relevant to testing. Um, stretch goal would be probably 12.9. So if you're looking at what you should read before next week, I'm, I'm going to shoot for trying to get to 12.9 and cover those topics during our hour session. I know we had uh, Brendan signed up uh, for that week for namespace. Uh, unfortunately, Brendan, I'm going to have to move you forward a couple of weeks. So if that does conflict with any of your um, scheduling, just let me know and we can figure something else out. Last kind of comment or last kind of comment announcement that I have for everybody before I open up for other additional comments or discussions. Um, there are a couple open spaces left, uh, you know, for compiled code, external data, Git, GitHub, automated checking, and then releasing a package. If you have interest in those topics, you know, please sign up for them. Um, uh, it would be good to kind of get some more people kind of mixed in there, um, but no pressure. So if nobody signs up, we'll definitely find other people to cover it. But um, I know there are a couple of people here that have a little more experience with me, especially in some of those areas. So if you get the opportunity, definitely take the chance to kind of speak on those. Uh, other than that, what other additional comments, questions do people have for Ryan or uh, questions for the group that people want to ask?
On that um, CRAN section, um, talking about the suggest, like you're absolutely right. That just um, you need know, to have like R markdown and what have you in the suggest, but like, cause you need a little vignette to run, otherwise it'll give you problems. But obviously it's not like inherent to running the package. So it doesn't need to be an import. I found it, uh, I found it sort of funny or I, I, I know this is from an optimized purposes or, or from a public or, or open source purposes that vignettes aren't rendered by CRAN necessarily on upload or, or posting. Um, I found that uh, not odd, I guess, as a package developer authoring a service, you're going to make sure that everything is in order prior to submittal and, and being able to do go through the gauntlet of error checks and test stats and linters, et cetera, to, to submit. Um, but I, I, I found it weird that if you're posting your code up there, they don't automatically render or, or uh, incur the cost of generating your PDF and HTML output. Um, I found that, like, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out that's the case, then how do you post it to CRAN? And I know that's going to probably be a chapter in here eventually, um, the submittal to CRAN. But yeah, I think when you do the build before you submit, you actually submit like the build package. So it's already sort of, um, it builds the vignettes at that point. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think it would be also, it might be computationally expensive for CRAN to keep, like build all those vignettes because like that's a, that's a pretty... 18,000, as I say, I think there's 18,300 and some packages right now on CRAN. So if it just hypothetically, if every one of them produces an HTML and PDF and yet you know, I doubled, tripled that amount of, of processing power. Yeah, that's that's quite a yeah. tax. And you might need to also decide on like the R version that CRAN should use for that, right? Because um, yeah, it wouldn't necessarily be like, you know, backwards compatible or whatever. <laughs> Whenever when the, the thing that I always think about in a in an open source community or, or collaboration is can't we just all get along? That's the the one thing that I always have in the back of my mind of of interacting with anybody because we're a global community and and there's so many different ideas, uh, thoughts, uh, uh, authoring styles and and formats, et cetera, that that enter into these package developments. Um, that <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to smile to myself. The whole can't we just get along? It's that bumper sticker that I'm referring to, but coexist. I think it's the coexist uh, uh, bumper sticker. I'm going to ask this question for the group because I think Ryan brought up a really good point about this idea of people who are new to like R and R itself and this, I, this idea of vignettes. Do you think vignettes are still an important part of the package development for to get users onboarded to using your package because like you said ryan like i probably didn't know much about vignettes or that space until i probably read this chapter and then i did the browse vignettes and it opened up that world like my, my thinking is is like it's it's a uh, package down right like creating websites right. and stuff like that is that I mean, I don't know. I, I kind of sit there and say, like, is if you're trying to onboard users into your and use your package, is vignettes where you want to spend your time really documenting, or is that really the purpose of it? You know, well, so I, 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 I constantly, as a as a technical person, and trying to order my thoughts in a meaningful way to convey exactly what it is for success to another user that may or may not have those same. Uh, uh, abilities. A vignette is just a long form narrative way of achieving that same task. But then as a, as a trainer, as an instructor, as a, uh, a teaching profession, I, asked, uh, I have to also ask, do they have the skill set to comprehend what I'm conveying? Is it written in a format or is it conveyed in a format that makes sense to others that may not have that formality? Um, just think of statistical modeling in general. If you open up and start reading some of the stats uh, uh, documents in there, I know if you're a, if you're entering into our studio, you're probably already in the mindset of data analytics. But statistical modeling, my point is just the mathematics of it. Just staring at an equation and like I don't even know what this language is trying to tell me. That is difficult, and it may create a barrier that somebody will not 
go that route or enter into that field of study without having somebody to mentor or guide them into that. I, 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 I guess my point being the question mark option of quick help tools chapter 10 in this document seems to be the one focal point that a lot of users will find and then vignettes don't have enough service. So um, maybe we ought to get more into the vignettes side of, of learning, in my opinion, because it is that long form narrative form. Um, and I, I would recommend to anybody, don't hesitate to email or post to a GitHub page or to the developer directly. It, for the most part, everyone within the R community is extremely accepting to uh, to those questions. So, or even post it in our own R community and have somebody else in a hierarchical form, relationship form, uh, maybe elevate your question into a higher order to those developers. Yeah, because the one thing I was thinking about was because um, I'm not real familiar with, you know, package down and all that. And so, but I know that's like, that's like the main interface that you kind of come across when you first are exploring a package as you're running across those websites. Um, and so I guess one of my critiques is, you know, of, of I guess the critique of the book, and I, I know they're adding additions to it, is probably a chapter on additional communication tools for your package outside of vignettes. Um, but yeah, that's just my, my viewpoint on it. This question may be posed to Isabella primarily just because of the RStudio community, but I found that RPubs is slightly weird. And I, maybe it's a, well, it, it could be an age thing, right? It, it, it could be just the relationship of how the open source community moves into higher order technology. Whenever I dump into RPubs or I find any links that connect to RPubs, I always have a tendency to get careful because that might be stale media, stale data. And I hope that I'm not providing our pubs a disservice in that respect. Um, I've just found an experience that if I find a URL that takes me in that path, it might not find the answer I'm looking for. It may not, I may not find it. Yeah, our pubs, I remember like in my beginning years of learning R was like a super valuable resource exactly like for that for like expanding on examples but like you said that was many years ago <laughs> and so i think it's important as always to like take a look at the date and consider like if things have um, been deprecated or superseded or things like that um in terms of other places to look one thing that comes to mind are the books like the cook uh cookbooks that folks create i find them to be extremely valuable in terms of like really detailed examples of um, different functions and how to use them like the one that comes to mind is the r markdown cookbook that like if you go through it every single chapter you just really really learn about r markdown and it are and all these things that are that it's capable of that otherwise like might not ever realize <laughs> it was possible Sorry, that was a great example. I wanted to post that to the yeah, to the channel. Very good. <laughs> Thank uh, you. If, if you don't mind me asking, how do you pronounce the person's name? Um, and I, he, uh, what's important about the developer? Um, he's, I think, a professor at the university, or is he's a graduate, PhD graduate of the University of Iowa. Um, so, Colin, in respect to the University of Nebraska and the University of Iowa, very close uh, competitors, both sports and academia. Um, he's not very far away, I guess, is my my comment there. But I don't know how to pronounce the name, and I don't want to misconvey it either. Yeah, uh, Iway. I've watched uh, uh, a few of his. Uh, presentations, the R Studio conference presentations. And it, yeah. getting into Markdown or getting into to using R for other tech writing services, um, I was very welcomed by some of the documentation that they have. Um, if, if anybody has ever went to the Bookdown site, that's another good relation, uh, the cookbook that Isabella was referring to. But uh, Bookdown has its own website, and there is a huge quantity of author media that you can access um, in respect to other 
data statistically minded individuals posting about um, how to do certain tasks. I'll try to find that URL too. Forgot about our pubs. I have definitely read some stuff from, you know, posted on our pubs and stuff. I guess, I guess just for me, when I do like my own search, it always just comes up with the package down site anymore than anything. So I guess, I guess well, the one thing that, like I said, I was trying to get at is just like different communication tools, like, you know, and, and what's in style, what's out, out of style and what is like, what are like, but because I understand there's other communities too, outside of, of like, just, you know, what the tidyverse team wants to use to communicate their packages right like because i understand that we all work in different industries and we work in different fields your field might be yeah our pubs is the place to go that's where that's where we get all of our information and so i i guess i need to take a step back and remember that it's my niche little area is not just like the only people that use this tool and communicate out so but I think there's, I think the book would, would benefit from an extra conversation about like, here are some other communication tools outside of vignettes. So, but. When do you guys reckon uh, you've got so much, I don't know, documentation that it's worth making a package down page over just the vignettes that are in the package? Like, where do you draw the line there? I think that's an excellent question and I can only speak to my limited experience of it. Um, I, I think that the previous cohort that did this kind of chapter took on that like vignette style development. And I thought that's where vignettes really shined was, you know, going through the development process through that because you get the bonus of not only like writing your process out, but then you get the documentation afterwards. And so I thought that was like a great idea. And, and I know like earlier on, I think Isabella shared uh, like vignette focused development and at, I tried using it. I thought it was great, but um, outside of like, when do you make the switch to package down? I haven't, I, I know very little of it. So I would kind of lean on the group to answer that for, for Rex here. Rex, if I can give you any, any, comment in that regard of, of questioning the vignette versus HTML page. I'm, I'm more HTML oriented. Um, for me, it's easier to bookmark a link uh, to a subject of, of reading at a later point. Um, I find PDFs get lost or in electronic form PDFs get lost in my file structure. I can't be alone in that thought. Um, my don't look at my download folder. It's literally just a wasteland of post-apocalyptic. I don't know where what's in there. Um, I, I should just delete all of it and, and kind of refresh. It'll probably make it easier for me to navigate. Um, it's the, uh, was it the circular, uh, the recycle bin is, is, uh, is another form of uh, data storage. Um, the, is it the oval, the oval waste paper basket or oval file cabinet. Anyway, comment there too. URLs and links are easier to, easier to manage. Yeah, just sort of on that line of thought, I was thinking about other ways to sort of advertise your package. I know our studio does a good job with um, different cheat sheets, especially for all their tidyverse packages. And so, um, yeah, even a chapter on how to create something like that would be cool. If I'm not mistaken, I think there is a package for creating cheat sheets. I, and I, I, it compiles, I think it's, it uses Bookdown to compile that cheat sheet list. Um, I don't know what it does with the graphical objects side of things, but the three columnar form of, of quick snippet cheat sheet comments, I think that is a, another book down rendering engine. Okay. Yeah, on that, my friends used a um, used poster down to make like an academic poster. Maybe you could make a cheat sheet using the same thing or something similar. Uh, I don't remember, Colin or Isabella, if you were in the, is it Rethinking Stats? There was a, there was one book club that started earlier this year, or maybe it was even late last year. But uh, one of the, one of the individuals in that book club was a professor at the University of Miami. And they, we were doing a, a two column format of uh, a base R versus tidy verse R versus Python. And it was this, column reform of 
markdown that I've never seen rendered before. And I thought that was a really awesome way to contrast code snippets between two points. Here's one format of how you would run the render the text and then here's another language or another format that you would render it in. And it was neat to compare the two together side by side. But that double columnar thing is, it's not, I, I think it's a hack. I don't think it's actually a, a formal method of, of documentation because it's like a three colon something, something, something separation. And then that's what forces it to go two column. Um, I think it's a markdown hack. I don't think it's a, an actual method that I'm familiar with anyway. I'm gonna I'm gonna get it wrong on the pronunciation, but is that is that Jarn again? Oh, maybe uh, it is. Yeah, yeah, maybe I'm it is. So sorry that I can't pronounce it, but um, somebody please correct me on the pronunciation. But that syntax sounds very familiar to what you're talking yeah. about, and they may have rendered it. They may have rendered one slide like that. Um, yeah, that's that's what I assume. But that syntax sounds very familiar with the split column. But I'm sure you can do that. But I think, I think Jarnigan and again, I, someone correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, it, I think, it, I think it just uses HTML and JavaScript. I think, and on the back end of it to yeah, render it, but you may compile it out to that. But I'm just, I'm talking out loud. I'm thinking out loud, so I'm not 100 percent sure. I haven't found a clear, definitive how to in relation to that person sharing uh, one of their presentations. When I looked at the syntax and I'm like, that doesn't look happy at all. Like, it, it looked just odd on the page to, to, to write it in that format. I started to change things and it the whole document kind of exploded. I'm like, all right, control Z, back up, back up, see if I can re replicate it again. I built a couple of presentations in it. When we did our R for DS book club, I tried to use it. It was like when you finally kind of got like the syntax down, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. I kind of liked it, but that's, that's outside of the conversation of, of um, our package development. But yeah. As a, I, well, as a quick note to documentation, if, if I can add one more comment. So I'm on a quest at the moment, uh, personally, I want to link SVG files. So the objects, the boxes that you have around an SVG file, be able to make that clickable and then have a pop out of information uh, related to it. There are example ways of doing that. And it's actually really simple to just add another uh, argument that says here, go hyperlink to this other pop out cell. It's the use of rendering that within a formal manner of R Markdown or any other format that says, enter the S, uh, SVG file, find the object, link the, or put the hyperlink there so that, that when the mouse hovers over it, it pops out. Anyway, just, <laughs> it's a quest that I'm on. So, super interesting. Well, I'm going to have to jump off here, but, um, you know, the group is, um, you know, like you, you can definitely continue the conversation if you'd like, uh, but I do really appreciate everybody coming in tonight. Uh, we will start talking about chapter 12 next week testing. And so I'm just going to jump off. So everybody have a good night. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. See you.